So how would you sort of describe your, your methodological and theoretical orientation to, to studying uh, ed, educational technology or, or ed tech? You've talked a bit about, you know, your interest in sociology and politics and policy. Um, how, do you, how do you bring those things together in your, in your work and your analysis, the way you think about technology? I mean, particularly given the fact that you were saying, Hey, I'm not a I'm not a techie. I think you even might have just said you have no real interest in technology. So maybe you could maybe you could talk about um, you know your sort of unique perspective and and how you study this. Uh, phenomenon. Uh, well, the thing to say is it's not unique at all. And um, when I started doing the PhD, there were so many other people asking the same questions, pursuing the same interests, arguing about the same issues. A lot of the stuff we're talking about in 2020. Two, uh, whenever you're watching this, is pretty much the same as people were doing in 1992. So it's not unique at all. And actually, I guess my approach is always to look about what critically minded folk are saying about technology outside of education and bringing those issues in. So I'm a little bit of a magpie and pretty pragmatic, and you could argue quite shallow. But the stuff, I mean, the people I was reading back, back in the day were asking some really interesting questions. So Langdon Winner, for example, and the whole kind of STS of a sort, but not the kind of active network theory, but I kind of picked up on winners, you know, how do artifacts have politics? And I got quite interested in the kind of the social shaping of technology and the social construction of technology, the Scott stuff. And just this idea that, you know, this socio-technical, it seems obvious now, and it was kind of obvious to lots of people in the early 90s, but the idea that we're not just talking about technological artifacts, we're talking about the coming together of the social, the economic, the political, the cultural, the historical, and the technical, uh, and schools are one place where this is kind of writ large. So I was kind of riffing off people like Winner and Neil Postman, um, and there was a great book actually by Kevin Rob Robbins and Frank Webster in the UK, which was called The Technical Fix, and it was about, I think it was education, computers, and industry, and that really got me interested in the kind of political economy aspect as well. Um, so I guess, yeah, my, my, my take on things is, is quite conventional now, um, and, but it's sort of coming from that socio-technical, um, social construction of technology um, way of thinking. Um, and that's now proven to be really, really important. And it's interesting to see that kind of perspective now, kind of mainstream. It's fairly obvious that's how you think about technology now. Back in 1995, when we were talking about you know, the what was it, the information superhighway and all of these other things. It was, uh, you had to kind of look hard for that kind of, that, that approach. So I would say I'm a critical social scientist, but I'm not critical in the fact that I use, you know, critical theory or I look back to the kind of Frankfurt School, but I do ask the kind of the, the prop, I try and problematize technology in terms of power, in terms of, you know, disadvantage and oppression. I'm very much a kind of taking a conflict approach rather than a consensus approach to, to thinking about the, the digital and education. And you bring up with um, problematizing technology, especially in education, where sometimes it can be taken for granted that um, that technology will save all the problems of education that are you know, already mired within the structure. In uh, 2016, you had a book that came out that is called Is Technology Good for Education? Which is a very provocative question. Um, thinking now, six years later, I want to maybe pose that question back again to you. Is technology good for education? And then also, what are some of its positive applications? But then also, I think we've seen and you've written about since then, what are the dangers of educational technology? Yeah, no, I would say for first off, I said I was very pragmatic and shallow. When it comes to writing books, I will kind of write anything that people ask me to. So there's a few of the more recent books. The titles have been suggested by the publishers. So I wrote a book called, um, oh, Christ, what's it? Oh, the other thing is I forget everything that I've ever written after, after I've written it. Um, Should Robots Replace Teachers, which is a terrible title. And I really didn't want to write a book called that. That was the publisher's idea because they thought, oh, that was sell. So I actually wrote it about work and ex professional expertise and, and AI. Um, the question itself, you get, and the same with, is technology good for education? That wasn't my idea at all. And you can play around with it, though, because you can argue about, you know, clearly good is a value driven statement. And it brings in this idea that technology is contested um, and, and, and is ideological and all the rest of it. So it was fun to play around with that. I, I clearly don't think technology is good for education at all. I think the, the dominant form of ed tech that we have at the moment 
I think is, is just a hellscape of just these huge platforms, Google Classroom, Turnitin, Teams. And we know that they're fundamentally based along logics of kind of uh, extraction, exploitation, individualization, standardization. And they, you can argue that they are just hollowing out the, the kind of any, any hope we have for public education. So if I'm being pessimistic, which I quite like to be sometimes, clearly technology is not good for education and in that book actually we look at the the role of how the corporate corporate interests are coming into education through technology we talk about this idea of democratization and the idea that technology makes education fairer um, there were other chapters as well that were kind of looking at other forms of what you might seem as good um, and so yeah in short no um but on the other hand i kind of want to get away from talking about technology in terms of good i mean there's lots of stuff at the moment about ai for good clearly it depends it depends on what you mean by good but also talking about technology is either good or bad is is also is also a way of kind of avoiding i think um david columbia wrote recently it's it's almost a dishonest way of avoiding more tricky questions about you know, class and race and ableism and oppression and um, you know, all, all of the things we should be talking about. So I guess technology is not completely good. It's not completely bad. It's all things in between. Um, and you can find examples of technology that fit your own version of good. So you talk to most ed tech people and they can come up with some you know, technologies. They would say, yeah, this is good for learning. So you'll often hear people say, you know, classroom technologies are very good for students with autism. You know, there's a whole ableist um, argument that you could use to contend that. But in terms of lots of people's idea of what good and learning means, yeah, you can point to examples. If you're coming at it from a social justice perspective, similarly, you can point to specific bits of technology or specific programs or initiatives that you could say have had a kind of progressive impact. But what I'm quite interested in is, is, is how any technology that you might say is good is very contextually bounded. It works within a particular local setting for a particular group of students with a particular teacher in a particular community in a particular region. The same technology that you might see as good when applied in another context with another teacher in another community at another time could have completely different kind of consequences. So it's very locally contextually bounded, socially shaped. And this is why you can't really talk about scalable one size fits all solutions because when technology does work, if it does work at all, it's very, very kind of localised. And so in some ways, yeah, I wrote a book called Is Technology Good for Education? But I'd like to go away from the idea of you know, a kind of homogenised good or a kind of generalizable bad and talk about the wrinkles and you know when technology breaks down and all the rest of it. So I could point you to three or four technologies I might think are good. Um, interestingly, we're talking on the week that Audrey Waters who is a great public scholar about ed tech. She's just a renounced education technology. She had a blog post last week saying, you know, this is it, I'm, I'm done. And the thing that she was saying tipped her over the edge was there was one software application that she would always say is, this is the really good idea about technology. I forget the name of it now, but it was a startup and a kind of like an app. And, and it just pivoted. And I think they just sold it to venture capitalists. And she said, my God, this is the one thing I was saying was good in their tech. And this has let me down. So I'm, I'm very wary of saying, oh, okay, the Raspberry Pi, for example, is an amazing example of technology. But yeah, there are things that you and I and Alex could point to that we would say are good. Yeah, they are. But as a whole, I think technology is the, the dominant form of excessive ed tech that we currently have is, is not good for us and will not be good for us.